Good morning. Good news. He is still risen. And in fact, he lives. And because he lives, you also shall live. A special welcome to any who may be visiting with us this morning in worship. And uh, it's good to see a good number of you. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around for the brief congregational meeting immediately following today's uh, first service. God has called and gathered us here and we begin in his name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sins before God and in the presence of one another. You may kneel as you are able or remain seated. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, I confess and acknowledge that I have sinned against you, not only by outward sins, but also by inward sins. I By the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus, all your sins are forgiven you, and you are given a new heart and a new life. Amen. Thanks and praise to you, Heavenly Father. Please rise. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. We share a sign of this peace. Please remain standing and join us in singing, Here I Am to Worship.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, as we have celebrated the festival of the resurrection of Christ, help us to show forth the power of his risen life in the world around us. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, You may be seated. The first lesson is from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as had need. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> the second lesson is from 1 John, the first chapter. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the, to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, the God, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk, walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord.
there are other children who'd like to come up, they're welcome forward. Nice job singing. You know your ABCs. Yeah, they do know their ABCs. Well, did you have a good week? Yeah. yeah? Shoveling snow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was something else. Well, you know what happened this week? Somebody got into trouble. No. No. You really did. Oh, yes, you did. Yeah. yeah, I guess so. Yeah, he got into trouble. Do you want to tell the kids what you did? Do I have to? I think you should. I, um, I stole some candy from the store. Mm-hmm. He stole some candy from the store. He likes candy too much. Yep. Well, and he got caught. How did that feel? Not very good. No, it didn't feel very good. That was wrong. That was against the law. He broke the law. He stole something from the store. So, what did you do? Hi. Did you blame it on somebody else? Yeah. Who did you blame it on? Jesus. Hmm. And what did Jesus have to say about that? He said that was okay with him. <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, that's kind of why Jesus went to the cross. For all of the wrong stuff that we do got blamed on him. And that's why he died. Now, how did that make you feel when you heard that, Joey? Not very good. Feels like I killed Jesus. Yeah, it does feel that way. When we sin, it feels like we're crucifying Jesus. That's not a good feeling. So if you don't want to feel that way, try your best not to sin. But Jesus will forgive your sins, even if you do sin. Hmm? So, this is a good lesson for Joey, but it's a good lesson for you guys too. When you have sin, remember that Jesus went to the cross because of that. But he said, that's okay, I'll take the blame for that. But I'll give you a new chance and a new start. So, Joey? Yeah? You gonna pay back the candy you stole? I'll try. Okay, good. And are you gonna steal candy from the store again? No way. All right, well, I guess he learned his lesson. And maybe you guys can learn from his mistake too, huh? from his sin. All right, let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, Thank you for forgiving us the bad things we do. Help us to remember how you love us and that Jesus takes the blame for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. Hi. We stand for the hearing of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, 
and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Fellow heirs of God the Father, brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace. Amen. What is the power of the resurrection? The resurrection's power is under the sign of peace. Peace to calm fears, to ease anxieties, peace to forgive sins, peace to erase doubts. That first day of the week, resurrection day, the disciples had locked themselves away and were cowering in fear. Not only fear of the Jews. Of course, they were afraid of the Jews who had succeeded in getting Jesus killed and would be happy to do the same for his followers. They were also afraid, however, of the Roman authorities and the military who carried out that execution and who weren't shy about stamping out any other revolutionaries who might rise up. And yet that's not all. They were actually afraid of Jesus as well. They knew they had failed him. They knew they had betrayed him. They had abandoned him in his hour of deepest need, standing aloof, denying they even knew him, and fleeing, leaving him to die alone. So as they sit there in fear, behind locked doors, in full knowledge of their complete failure of the one they had so lovingly and devotedly called teacher and Lord. Kind of shows how strong their love was, doesn't it? Hmm? They're also fully aware of the fragile nature of their safety and of their future. And as they sit there, there's a knock on the door. Well, no, actually there wasn't. <laughs> If there had been a knock at the door, they would have either gone silent and dark or they would have piled themselves all ten against the door because they weren't going to trust anyone who might come through it. So, Jesus was just going to have to find his own way in. And he just shows up, never mind the door. He's just standing there and the first words out of his mouth are peace. He knew what they were thinking and feeling. He knew their fears. So the first word he speaks is peace. And with those words, he brings their racing heart rates down. Their fears subside, their anxiety is eased, and they feel the forgiveness of their sins and of their failures that comes through his word of peace. But then their heart rates start to go back up a little bit as they realize, yes, it really is him. It's alive. And in what is perhaps the understatement of all of Scripture, they were glad when they saw the Lord. <laughs> you think? I mean, you would be too. But it's very important not to say that it is only Jesus 
who is standing there in that room speaking peace to them. Because if you do, that leaves God the Father out there somewhere, maybe still as the angry killer of his only begotten and beloved Son, and whose wrath still might have you in its crosshairs. It is absolutely critical in this tender scene of peace and forgiveness and joy to realize that God the Father is fully present in and with Jesus Christ. And a good way to realize that is to remember some of Jesus' words. In John chapter 5, 19, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So who entered the room that day and spoke peace? It is God's own self. So when Jesus speaks peace, forgives sins, restores relationship, it is God the Father working through the tangible flesh and blood expression of Jesus. And what comes next? The third person of the Trinity. <laughs> he breathes on them. If you remember that in both Hebrew and Greek, the word for breath is the same word for spirit and for wind. You'll see that the Holy Spirit is right there. The same spirit that hovered over the face of the deep in the dark chaos before creation is now moving over the faces of the disciples. Dispelling the darkness and chaos in which they had been hiding. And it grants order and peace and purpose to them, giving them the most sacred task possible. the task of dispensing the forgiveness of sins, of bringing light to a dark, dark world. I mean, imagine it. These ten, Judas, of course, no longer with them, and Thomas hiding somewhere else, these ten, who had so utterly and completely failed Jesus, now are made his first and his most powerful ambassadors the power of the resurrection. Peace to calm fears, ease anxieties, forgive sins, erase doubts, and now a power to carry out into the world the forgiveness of sins. You know, there's one thing that is just as true today as it was in those days. Failure is looked upon as the scourge of society. The expectations we establish make it impossible for those with flaws to go anywhere or do anything. We grow up learning that the vortex of failure has no possibility of escape. Its consequences are inescapable. Children who fail well, they're told to seek the failing in their parents so they can shift the blame. Loser has become such an identity, tightly wound to someone that they are unable to see themselves as anything else. The mess-ups have been pushed to the outskirts. And in this ball game, one strike and you're out. So don't screw up. Or at least you better make sure you're good at covering up. Lord have mercy. We are so hard, so unforgiving, so unbelieving in God's merciful and gentle love that we think we have to perform to perfection in order to be loved by God or by anyone else. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to you, Heavenly Father, that you are completely unafraid of darkness, unshaken by indignity, unfazed by corruption, unaffected by failure. Father, you who are so infinitely tender and loving and forgiving. 
you who work in the ashes, in the ruins and the soot of failure. <laughs> it's there that he shows up, and it's there that he does his best work. When you have been brought to the end of yourselves, then he can make a beginning. And look at what he does. He who breathes creation into existence by his word breathes upon you and into you, feeds you with his word and creates and recreates worth, beauty, esteem, order, peace, and purpose for you. I've just got to share this one little thing with you because, wow, close to 20 or more years ago now, this one little phrase woke something in my heart while I was at seminary. And actually, we're going to be studying it this Tuesday at the coffee shop. 500 years ago this month, April 1518, Luther submitted 28 theological theses for debate in Heidelberg. And I only want to share the 28th one with you because it fits exactly with what happened to the disciples and it's exactly how our gracious Heavenly Father operates with you. Here it is. The love of man comes into being when it finds what is pleasing to it. The love of God creates what is pleasing to it. Because God loves you. You are lovable. It's that simple. No preconditions, no performance, no anything. God loves you, therefore you're lovable. You are valuable, you have a purpose, and you will live. That love is creative, powerful, and restorative, and it brings into being something beautiful. You. So guess what? Pressure's off. Whew. Thanks be to God. The pressure's off. You are lovable because God's love makes you so. And in that knowledge, you know the power of the resurrection. Peace. Peace with God. Let us pray. Father, our hearts cannot begin to contain your love. And yet we ask you to pour it into us abundantly so that it overflows. Help us to see and to believe that we may live. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join with us.
Together with the saints of all times and places, we confess the one true faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in... You may be seated. We join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, your prophets declared that you do not break the bruised reed or quench the dimly burning wick. Remember in mercy all who struggle with the darkness of doubt or despair and shine into their hearts the peace of your Son's resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, our healer, we commend to you all those who are in need of restoration, whether of body, soul, or mind, and we lift their names to you in our hearts. Lord, grant to them your peace, that they may bear their suffering with patience as they await your gracious healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Risen and reigning Lord, breathe into all your people your spirit and embolden them to proclaim your resurrection and the forgiveness of sins in your name, absolving the penitent and calling the impenitent to repentance and faith. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, you graciously and abundantly feed us day by day. Help us to show our gratitude by sharing freely with those who hunger and thirst for basic necessities, that your name may be glorified. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Before a word is on our lips, O Lord, you know it entirely. So we offer up to you the prayers of our hearts. Gracious and loving God, all these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant us for the sake of your dear Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. We bring forth our tithes and our offerings.
Please stand. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us to see Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father. You may be seated. All the baptized who believe in the true presence of Christ in these elements and who know their need of forgiveness are welcome at his table.
Please rise. And now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen you in body and soul and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. A couple of brief announcements before we conclude this morning. A uh, sign-up sheet for April and May coffee hours. It's outside the secretary's office. Uh, it's a little bit empty, so please help out if you're able to. Um, the CLCW Salad Luncheon is coming up very soon, Tuesday the 17th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. and tickets are available in the office. Uh, at the late service today, we'll celebrate the joining of Kenzie May Bushin to the death and resurrection of Christ in holy baptism. She is the daughter of Zachary and Brittany Bushin. Uh, there is a list of volunteers needed in the parish news as well as information about other area happenings. So uh, take a look at those when you get some time. And uh, please, after the closing song, I'll have you be seated and we'll stick around for just a few minutes so we can establish our quorum and take care of a little bit of congregational business. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please join us in singing Creation Sings, the Father's song. Written by Father's song, he calls the sun to wake the dawn, and from the course of day, to leave me falls in crimson rays. It's been We sit in peace to fear God, love God, and trust God. Now,
I welcome Congregational President Tim Schultz forward and we'll begin our meeting forthwith.